Hello. <laughs> Was that any louder? Um, the mission of the prestigious Inside Out lecture series is to bring the best minds of our generation, I know I nicked the line from Allen Ginsberg, I can't help myself, to inspire and support the work students and staff do across the School of Art, Architecture and Design at Leeds Beckett University. We are therefore delighted to be flying in from Amsterdam in the Netherlands, the artist Laurence Ajeter. We must also take this opportunity to thank our affiliate partner, the Lawrence Stone Trust, for making Lawrence's, they're all called Lawrence now, um, visit possible by hosting her as artist in residence at Shandy Hall, Coxwold. So thank you very much, Patrick Wildgust, for your ongoing support. Lawrence was born in Marseille, in the south of France. She studied art history in Aix-en-Provence, where she specialised in 17th century Dutch trompe l'oeil and completed her studies in Amsterdam, having fallen in love with Dutch painting. From there, she went on to study fine art at the Reitveld Academy, and after finishing her studies, she worked briefly for art auction houses, including Christie's, and learnt the system from the inside out. Do you see what I've done there? Inside out? Yeah? yeah. Okay. I've lost my place now. That was, that was a bad idea. Okay, for the last 10 years, Lawrence has worked full-time as an artist and is represented by the Art Affairs Gallery in Amsterdam. She has exhibited internationally in many solo and group exhibitions and has presented her work at many venues, including no, no less than the Louvre in Paris, the Hermitage Museum in Amsterdam, and the Guggenheim Museum in Bilbao. We are delighted to welcome her here to Leeds Beckett University, where our strap line is opening minds, opening doors. Please join me in extending a very warm Yorkshire welcome to the French artist, Laurence Agatheur. Thank you very much, Simon. And thank you, Patrick. So um, I selected to share with you works of the last 10 years. Actually, I couldn't do any earlier because I started 10 years ago. I started rather late. Um, as uh, Simon just told you, I had another study and another kind of starting career before when I made a total 180 degree turn. And that's you're going to see right away that 180 degree come into the picture as well. Um, so I, I selected some works of mine about, yeah, I think it's about six, seven projects, and I'm going to try to, I think we're going to, I think one hour would be enough. And, uh, <laughs> and then uh, if you, if you uh, please feel free to ask any question, don't be shy or, or anything, there is not such a thing as a bad question. Well, maybe there is, but I will do as if it's not. <laughs> so, um, good. Let's see, which uh, button shall I? This? I guess the, this one? Yeah, no, I, I found it. Thank you, sorry, Simon. So, yeah, so 180 Degrees Encyclopedia, it has nothing to do actually <laughs> with my personal path, where it has, but in a different way. Uh, like Simon, I love books, and I, I think they are very important, beautiful um, medium to convey, uh, to convey art, so books as being a, an autonomous artwork. And, but my practice is very multidisciplinary. I'm mostly, let's say, a photographer, even though I don't take many pictures myself. I'm not a very good technician. So I always seek the help of others. Um, um, I, also use, I, I also work with performance installations, sometimes in textiles, and very regularly with books. And as we share that particular passion with Simon, I thought I'm going to put a lot of books in the story today. So this book, the 180 Degrees Encyclopedia, <coughs> was born at, um, out of a love-hate relationship with encyclopedia I had since my teenager time. Uh, I didn't, uh, let's say, I loved the encyclopedia because I was quite bored as a teenager and I couldn't wait to be old enough to find my way into the world. So I was looking into these three by four centimeter uh, inches or something images to try to escape through the, <laughs> through the image. On the other hand, it really bothered me because it's such a, an encyclopedia is really telling you what the world is. And it's big like this and it's doing that and it's there. And, and that, I found it a bit too, I'm not sure about this, the English, the right English word, 
patronizing, I'm not so sure, but like too directive, too, too, too clear and too saying too loud one, only one side of the story. So I decided to remake the encyclopedia that was on my bookshelf as a teenager. Uh, what you see is the La, La Rousse Encyclopedia, it's about six, seven hundred pages. And I, I scanned, well actually I, I found someone who loved me enough to scan it all for me. <laughs> I scanned all the pages and then uh, and I replaced, I gave myself a bit as a constraint, as a game. Uh, I, I replaced two-thirds of the landscapes within the encyclopedia. So what I wanted to, I wanted to give an own gaze into something normally very objective. And that would not be only my gaze, but I would very much, how uh, do you call that? Ask, I will ask a, a lot of friends to help me. So I, I wrote a little protocol, like where are you going on holiday uh, this summer? And then, okay, because I need that, 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 and that place. So if you go to Marrakesh, and um, it would be lovely if you could visit that mosque, and if you're exactly in front of it, just re-photograph it, then I have a proof that you are at the right spot, and then turn your shoulders 180 degrees and photograph exactly the opposite. And then send me both of the images then. I didn't use the proof, it was just to make sure people would be a bit enticed to do their best. Some people completely forgot to turn around, that was a bit irritating, <laughs> when it was Jerusalem or, I don't know, places where, yeah, it's not always easy to. But it was really worthwhile and it was wonderful. I gave myself two years to, to do this project. I did about a third of the images myself. And after a while I thought, hey, but actually it seems now I had enough of it. Also time in, in let's say, I, I, was I want to move to some other things as well. But also I liked it that the images were, let me, that the images were <coughs> nicely, um, there was still so many images I didn't change, about one third I didn't change in the 180 degree. So only landscapes huh? uh, or monuments or art in public space, but everything exterior, but not from helicopter because, you know, that would be a bit like strange or difficult. So, <laughs> but I was very uh, rigorous about that it would be exactly the, the right place. So if you, sh if, it, if you have to go up the st six stairs, it has to be six stairs because you, need, you want really to be at the same spot. That's more special. And then really, so here you have Copenhagen, the city center, and the below left, and Cord is a, it's a French uh, village, and you have the Cordoba in Spain, most which didn't change. Where in this case, very often, as you see, you see at first glance that uh, something happened, of course. But sometimes in it's because you see so many pages, so many images, and sometimes this, this they seem to blend very much in their surrounding, and they become a bit oldish just by the surrounding. And sometimes you can look over, creep over an image, and not even realize that it it was taken approximately. This was about 40 years later, I think, or 30. I forgot a bit. So here up you have Chinon, uh, the ruins of the castle being a, a tent in a camping site. And you have um, Istanbul, the, br the same bridge, but just the other side of the bridge. And here you, it would be a sculpture of Carpo, it's an 18th century sculptor, an allegory of the dance. And this woman is performing something very contemporary here for us. And very often there would be people photographing the icon, of course. So that's also something that was nice to add into the, to put back in the book. I changed nothing of the words, only on the, on the front page is written, um, I think I just add one line, and such and such, I don't remember, a few hundred images on 80, 180 degrees. I hear again some people photographing in Padova, and the one below not being changed. I made a very small edition of uh, only 15 books. Uh, they were hand, hand bound and I was very, very happy with it because yeah, it feels like a little treasure and it's so many individual stories, which I didn't, rec I, didn't I got fantastic stories from people and I was going like, what should I do with it? Something or not? And he said, no, I keep it very dry. I keep it very simple, but very precise. So, what, yeah, funny things happen, like for instance, the Eiffel Tower. 
Actually, you should, you should see what is at the op you should not see it, you should see the opposite side. You should see Ecole Militaire. But yeah, so sometimes, so I, I like how it, uh, how it collides in a, and, and sometimes also image rhymes, you see, that's uh, totally coincidental. And this man very nicely taking care of his dog. And yeah, yes, also like yeah, formal echoes. Acc yeah, accidental and the parliament in London. So that was uh, my first book. Then having seen in so many pages uh, reproduction of art, because of course you have the maps and you have the famous people, but it's a lot of art. So, and as I had studied uh, art history, I thought, hmm, it's really time for me to do something with an art book now. So I looked again on my bookshelf and I found this book, Le Louvre. It's a catalog from the Louvre from, from the 80s. And um, I thought, what a beautiful thing. What a, the, I love the shape, I love the design, you know, square, very nice, super. And if you look, wait, must be there. Yeah. And if you look, um, so I went to the Louvre with the idea, like, what can I do? So I, I found, well, this is the object. I really love it. The texts are brilliant. Um, I love the whole thing, black and white and color or intermix. I, I really like the, the object, but what then? So I went to the Louvre, I took tons of photographs, and I went back home, looked back at them, and what would be the nicest thing to do with? And then I made a, a decision to replace all the paintings in this book by photographs I made myself but with people interfering between the painting and me. So just being a simple visitor with a small camera. And here, you, if you see where I think, meanwhile, you have found it, the, the shoulder on the L and the, the top of the, of, of the head of someone in front of the Mona Lisa, I gave myself, I don't remember, one, two or three days to go at so many paintings possible. And I'm not a very patient person, so I wouldn't say they're all too long. You know, it happens or not. And actually, I'm not very picky about what would happen because I love the variety of it. Sometimes, uh, I guess you're going to see some people melting it, and sometimes they, they just don't. They <laughs> completely stand out and really block the view. But I love it all. And sometimes there was no one, <laughs> and then that was it. Uh, so I left black and white, everything that was black and white. Once again, I didn't change the text. Only at the end of the book, I was a little bit bold that I <laughs> it was a nice suggestion of a friend of mine that thought he's totally right. The I, uh, ISBN number, I, I uh, put a line through and I put my own, like, <laughs> like a well, little inside joke, hoping that the Louvre uh, also find it a nice joke. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> But you will bring me oranges, <laughs> maybe, Patrick, Simon, I can't remember. No, it should be, it should, by now it should be okay. It's such a small edition, 500 books, you know, it's not about money, so, okay. So, uh, yeah, and I had so much fun doing it that I decided to do it again, but this time in life size. So I, I thought, how nice would that be if the person would be reproduced in life size? So it would be like... 80 centimeter or six, 60 centimeter. And so for that, I went to the Louvre again, but this time with an authorization that took me three quarters of a year to get. I think I had to pay 500 euros or something like this. So it was kind of, hmm, okay. And, yeah, and I had to go on a day when it was closed, the Louvre. They didn't let me because a tripod, you could, you know, fall through a painting and that would be the end. So, and I thought, ha, ah, but that my whole concept is falling apart now because should be should be accidental and visitors what do i do and then i thought yeah okay it takes a chance uh, you always if you don't like it you let go but let it takes a chance uh, i practice a bit more at the rex museum to know really what i was looking for what i liked and um, i asked some un how do you call uh, um, unprofessional models to to be there for me people i didn't even know friends of my cousin with sports bags full of clothes and I had chosen the paintings but and I, I didn't really chose the people I want a bit of variety but I didn't do too much research I wanted it fresh I didn't put lighting I wanted to be close to the real thing even though I knew of course I'm staging people so it's gonna get another kind of presence huh? 
and this is one of the few things that happen. Actually, this is me, it was a test of the light, and then after I've preferred that one than the other one. I like the ear, <laughs> so. And this one is particularly nice, so it's, it's a tondo, it's cut uh, also in that round shape. This black hole is rather mysterious. On life size. Then I had the super luck to be asked by the um, Museum of Modern Contemporary Art in Nice to, to exhibit the work. It was very, very nice opportunity to see the work in a different context. And uh, really funny things happened that I found, you know, just Googling my name, that people have put images of themselves in front of my photographs. I could have expected it, but even though it was a lovely surprise, I really liked it. I started to collect them myself. <laughs> so, and uh, yeah, so that was, that was that project. Now it's really um, connected, but not, I it's, it's again a book. It's connected and not, uh, not connected to art history because the source of this work is it's, uh, anthropology. The, the French most known anthropologue, Claude Lévi-Strauss. Claude Lévi-Strauss, ah yeah, he became very famous with the book Triste Tropique, Sad Tropics, in, the, in 1955, I think. And so what happened is that I was, because I know you're a student, so I, I want to give you also a bit of a context that you can project yourself. <laughs> so I thought, yeah, I was invited to a residency and uh, in a place in the north of the Netherlands, in a very small village, that, uh, in a place where I had never been before, the whole region, I didn't know it was known to be a bit wild and people very, a bit sober type of person, not, not really uh, a bit different than the type of people I grew up with in Marseille, let's say. And so I thought, oh, okay, let's see what happens. I'm a bit curious, but uh, how are we going to how it's going to be. And I was with a friend of mine, Ronald von Tinhoven, and he was at that, I was telling him, I think I, they're going to see me as an Indian and, and the same, or something like that. I dropped the word Indian in, in the sentence and said, I'm reading Triste Tropique from Claude Levi Strauss, and maybe that's a good starting one. I said, oh, wow. Okay, let's have a look. So we went together, we looked for the first edition of the book, and we found that at the end of Triste Tropique, on the very first edition, Actually, this is the this is the artist book, normally you know in a some kind of plastic thing uh, like that, and then you have the two little booklets. And oh yeah, but that you see is here too. But you see the size now. And at the end of the artist book, you have at the end of, of his book, there is a, a part called Tristotropic Illustration or text, or text, and there are 63 images that he gave a bit as a illustration of text, it means illustration outside of the body of, of the text. So it's just a little extra because he loved photographing and I think he had a really wonderful experience with the three different tribes in the middle of Brasilia. So in the 50s eh, or late 40s. And here you see a photograph of the, the first edition that I found crazily enough at the public library of Amsterdam because it's a very expensive book so it was good luck to find it there. And then I thought right away, how good would that be to make the same photograph with the people from this village? And then also how difficult, because of course of the, the whole nudity thing. Um, um, I'm myself a, a, a not a person that would easily, even to help a very kind artist, do things like this. So uh, I asked Ronald, we, we, we de developed the whole concept together, what to add, what not to add what to do and not to do, how to approach it, how to convince people, what to, you know, what would be. But it worked out uh, beyond, beyond expectation. This is Ronald under my name. And so this is the, the, the Triste Tropique book from, this is a total, so you see on now on, uh, on your right, the, the Levi Strauss and, and then uh, our interpretation. It's a, it's a proper facsimile of the first edition of the book. Same, same type of page, same size. Only the cover, the, the gray cover is something we added, but this is exactly, exactly what you would find at the end of this 300 page book. And then so, I mean, if you want to know how we did it, 
That could be an easy question at the end, so I can leave that for you if you're curious. But we managed, and that was really wonderful. I think the reason why we managed beyond all the, let's say, anecdotal things is bec because I was totally convinced about the fact that what we were doing was not voyeurism, but it was something that is goes beyond the um, interest in seeing people naked. It was about capturing something generic in someone and saying, so who you are is not you as such and such person living in that address and with that name and that first and last name. You are a person of that age in s this kind of moment of your life. And in that sense, you're representing all the other person on earth sharing the same age and, and the same condition, even though with a total cultural back totally different cultural background because there is a gap of 80 years and I don't know how many thousand kilometers, must be something like, what would that be, two and a half, I don't know, I'm not so good at geography. But so that, that was for me the main thing, how beautiful it is, this continuity in the in the in the expression of people, <coughs> and also where where is it uh, not working? Where where it could just be true? You know, this young boy could hold maybe a mobile phone or something, and or actually I think it was a piece of wood, but uh, what it was on the floor. But of course, this lady would not, in open air, easily lift up her left breast. So so there were some images that were totally yeah uh, fr making a very nice friction that makes you raise in you a lot of other questions that, are that were not the main goal um, in my eyes of this book, but raise a lot of other layers of possible interpretation and questioning. Oh, okay. Uh, I add this, this, um, this slide just to show you that I made the decision, so that could be interesting for you as students as well, I made the decision to, that it was worth it to show the images out of the book. We had a discussion, Ronald thought it was boring. He said the book is the work, just let it be. And maybe, yes, maybe in a video format, you know, in as, a, as a video work um, projection. I was not so sure about the projection. And I thought, well, listen, I, I think it's, it's really a photographic it's really a photographic approach. Um, of course, the book is the matrix, but I thought of it. I made some tryouts, and I thought, when I see it like this in, in, in rows, and it works as well. You don't need necessarily to be bound to, in this case, each time, each book, each you have to re-ask your question again and again. It's always different, but I'm not even sure I'm right now, but it feels good when I saw it also uh, in different situations. Good, so here are some examples. And it was a miracle that when we went to that village, because actually we made the decision of this project even before we had put a foot there. So it was incredible that within, within five, six kilometers, we got everything we needed. I also tried to keep the accuracy, so there are little numbers with legend, le legends, legends. And then, um, so this man was the informant of Levi Strauss, and then this person was also the person that was helping us to find the right locations and convince people. So that was Tristropic Adventure. That was three, four years ago when a city, again of the north of the Netherlands, for some reason, there is magnetism probably, then another place, they, uh, the, a, a city asked me to, to think of a project that could create social cohesion in a neighborhood with a lot of difficulties. And for me, it was a, a, a bit of a turning point because I thought, how wonderful to do something now that can be hopefully useful, and that will, I mean, it makes it a even a bigger challenge because you want to make and a good work and something that could serve a, a, a goal, a social goal. And for me, it was a big point because then from then on, my work took a bit of a, of a social 
past, let's say, where from the very beginning you don't see this project, but I was even when I was doing the encyclopedia, uh, 180 degrees, I was already working with people, um, making videos of all kind of perform, yeah, performing, making them perform things and performing with them, and so it was not new to 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 interact with people, but let's say like more the care side came a bit from that moment. I decided that to help this community maybe m create a garden would be a good idea because the name of the village, of the neighborhood was referring to a middle age monastery, yeah? And, and yeah, garden are the most, it's the most beautiful symbol for you put attention to it and something fantastic grows. So it's, it's about the whole metaphor of taking care of each other and and um, yeah, seeing the result of your of your work and, and uh, of the input. So then uh, I decided to make a reconstruction, very very precise, of the first known, uh, precise almost to the centimeter, I would say, uh, to the first known medicinal herb garden in uh, in Europe. Known in Europe, it's it's uh, in Saint Gallen, the Abdei of Saint Gallen in Switzerland. And it's, it's, it's very known because it was the first monastery that has been um, designed in a, in a map. And this map was so good, with also yeah, very good architectonic uh, drawing, that it has been reproduced many, many times and it went throughout the world of Europe. We could say more or less, barely, that uh, the, monastic, the, the monastic plants and also the organization of the medicinal gardens are derived, I'm not sure about the English, but derived from the Sint Gallen. So I could know exactly how big it was, which plants were in there, there were 16 different types. And so I proposed to the community to work together and build this garden. And it was very well received, there were children in pyjamas until the late evening, getting totally black before to brush their teeth. And there were people, more or less in wheelchair, coming to drink coffee all day. And they were making arguments, and they were laughing, and they were all that. And it, it, was, it was really nice. Generally, it was mostly, um, yeah, it, it, it felt completely good. I think they were totally happy, because it was also um, a ground that was a bit wobbly by the river. And it was, crazy enough, exactly the place where the, the their monastery had been. So it was strange coincidence also that just now this place was free. So, but because I'm a very visual minded person and I love the interaction, but I really wanted to catch a bit of a metaphor of what we were doing with images. And then came, then I thought I'm gonna make a publication again. Um, this is the cover of the same book that you see here. Um, Healing plants for hurt landscapes. So, parallel to the building of the garden, actually, the wall, the thing that takes a long time is the preparation. Obviously, you have to again to convince the people and to go through that process of explaining what you're doing and get them so far they're going to put time and energy. And once it's there, then, then um, parallel of the building of the garden, I organized very close by a workshop during three days as well. This was non-stop open for uh, very young to very old. And I have made a selection of about a bit more than 100 images of destroyed landscapes. Here you see Rotterdam, just bombed after the Second World War. There would be historical images, there would be images from the, from the media from not so long ago, it was the that would be the earthquake in Italy, uh, which was the name of this place, Aquila, a couple of years ago. That would be deforestation in Malaysia on your right, or some awful typhoon in Japan on your left. So here again, Japan, with awful tsunamis and awful stuff. So the, the whole thing was, let's make a symbolic gesture to this uh, uh, symbolic healing gesture, as if we could really, just by the intention, do something positive. 
for, th for that specific context. And then, yes, so the, you could approach it. I really like that's why it's called also the, the overall title of the project is Herbarium Cataplasma, because uh, this cataplasma, I'm not sure in English, but I think I know in English is pultis. It's a Latin word and also a French word. So I like this, you know, this idea of this hot pultis or cold to for wounds. And, and I said, yeah, so wh what about maybe we can hear images? So let's, let's work on that. So there were different approaches. Some people just put, just for instance, a lady said, but I, I think what we need here is that and that root. And uh, so I had uh, a total, I had a library of uh, more than hundreds different landscapes from around the world and different ca causes of uh, destruction. And I had also about 100 different plants with labels. So it was kind of a double library. And, uh, and the labels were written what the plant was, but also what you can use it for uh, disinfectation or b uh, wound from burning or things like this. And but I left people completely free. Some people really wanted to choose, yeah, I'm going to take ex specifically this for that. And some people say, no, I think it looks good and it feels good. And this is it. So uh, as soon as this, uh, someone from that lady said, oh no, but it needs, a, it needs a root, you know, it needs a root. And then she went out in the garden, picked up a root, plunge it on and I think, good, you know, I'm not even sure if, it's if you say it's medicinal, must be, medi I mean, somehow you have not to be too, you know, uh, it's good if the people, what I really wanted that the people engage in what they are doing with some kind of a heart, something honest. Uh, of course, a lot of them did it just because they saw I put a lot of effort in the garden and they, they said, okay, it's not so much, let's do this thing for her too. But some people loved it, the process, and they came back every day and they, they, they tried every possible image. <laughs> so in the end, I had really hundreds of possibilities to choose from. I made some myself as well, because I could show them also some a different approach uh, to, to the image, different techniques to go around with the, with the herbs and, and the plants. Uh, so that is what happened. Then I, I made a selection for, for, the, for the publication. A very good friend of mine made, uh, Eric Kessel, a very good graphic designer excellent graphic designer made, uh, made the book. We decided to do it as a bit, yeah, but you see, you see it as a newspaper um, with full pages or three quart pages and um, different kind of, and I think it, it's very nice. So on the top, each time you have um, in, in the book, you have the name in Latin of one of the plants used or sometimes the only one and next to it, the name of the place. So this is 9-11 with ginger and garlic. So my mother said, these poor people suffered so much, why do you put a gratin de finois on the top of, <laughs> of them? And I was, well, you know, <laughs> I'm not sure, but it's meant well and it's ginger and not potatoes. <laughs> but it's good to be open to different kind of... Uh, so, yeah, Gaza, Palestina. And I just told you that I, I, had, I really enjoyed seeing what happened to the people, that it was working. Actually, uh, it was a few years ago now, and I'm not quite sure about the garden. Um, I had also the, to decide how sh strict I would be about letting them do what they want after the project with the garden. And I decided to completely let go. And I thought, yeah, you did, I did it is really in my, I you know, here I could really control what I want and what I don't want. But I think the garden I did for th I did for them. I did for them to get together, and then you have to let go. I think it's just better to fight with things that are old, and you know. And I, s I feel good about it. Probably it's completely different. Since I went there, I went only once, and then they had broadened the main path when I did everything <laughs> to the centimeter for for wheelchair. And I think, yeah, fair enough. I mean, of course, and things like that. Leviathan was a project that was uh, proposed to me by the director of the uh, Museum Dohus in Haarlem. In uh, it's like 30 kilometers from Amsterdam. It's a bit of it's a mini welcome uh, welcome museum, welcome trust, or I don't know what it's called. It's all about it's a museum of psychiatry and the mind. So uh, in not only psychiatry but also yeah all kind of brain processes. But in that specific case, he asked me if I could 
if I could um, develop a project around the right of, uh, I'm not sure in English, self, that you decide for yourself what happens to yourself, so that, that other people um, in psychiatric context, where is the, the line when they can decide for you, even if you don't agree with things. So it was a pretty complicated assignment, I thought. But okay, so I, I did some research and I found out I could approach it in three different from three different main things. And one was medication, as I'm a very bad, I understand nothing of chemistry, I don't even want to, somehow it didn't attract me. You know, over medicament and medicamentation wha was the issue. So when you get more, then you completely flatly, uh, yeah, kind of daydreaming the whole day. The other one was electroshock, the use of electroshock for people with uh, very bad depression, because it has been found that it helps them for, for a while to reshuffle in, in the right way and feel much better. But of course, uh, yeah, if you give electric to people without their con consent, it's, it's a very, very big ethic item. And there has been so many scandals in the 80s, 90s. So they saw this, they went, this, this has been kind of solved, I think, at least in the Netherlands. I wouldn't know here in, in England. But it has been solved in a sense with really, really strict protocols to take care of people in the way that, uh, th that they don't suffer, that they, that, that they agree, that they understand why it's good, all, all that. Anyway, I don't get to this digression. <laughs> but anyway, so I thought, okay, this is, has been really been talked about and taken care of. But one thing which is really totally, totally bad in the Netherlands, where it's ashamedly, ashamingly bad still, to the point that the United Nations sent a letter of... Uh, almost a bit of a threat that things really have to get better urgently is isolation cell. Am I saying it real? Is it the right word? Solitary confinement. Solitary confinement. Thank you. Uh, without your consent, of course. So there is a big mis uh, overuse of that in the Netherlands, also for children care in children care institution context, so it's, it's totally scary. And there have been some cases of people dying there without, without uh, the personnel noticing. Huh? So it's really, uh, it has been, and unfortunately only through scandals, people wake up a little bit, and then it's f everybody forgets again. So now, um, so whatever could I do to add, a, uh, I, what can I do about about this, to yeah, to, to give a bit of my my vision on the well, not not as necessarily a critic, but of course, it's a, but more like actually, these uh, solitary confinements are passed. They should be passed. There must be other ways. In Scandinavia, they have found much more human ways. So. It's a question of selling how they did, and but of course you use more medicaments. So it's always very, very complex issues anyway, but yet it can be so much better. So I thought, but they should be passed. So let's treat these rooms as past. And what can they be now? Let's open them to new futures. They are like uh, nine square meter rooms, always two next, to one to the other. When the sun shines inside, then um, in that specific one, an automatic curtain goes down to protect you from the sun. So I mean, the only nice thing that could happen to you is it's taken care of that you're not gonna be too hot or bothered by the sun. And I mean, it's really, really, there is no edge, there is nothing that you could touch and arm yourself and very, very scary place to be. So I decided I'm gonna change, I, I will open this room, give it a new, every day a, a, a new function and have personnel and the people living in it was the closed department of the uh, psychiatry. Let them experience this place with a different, I, I, fr from a different uh, perspective. So the first day I changed it in a terrarium with uh, giant piton snakes. And here you see some more days. One day it was a massage parlor at the left 
it was like really individual care and it was smelling delicious and it was someone uh, specifically g good in taking care of people with with um, mental impairment how do you say it? i'm not sure i said well but uh, uh, so to make them feel really good so th it was an inscription that day the the, the python it was the, the python snakes it was um, you could s you could see them it was uh, well i think we see the next slide yeah, upper left, they w it was a um, plexiglass kind of half plate. So you could really see them from close moving, moving around. And you see the lady um, living there. She, she put very accordingly her top. I was very grateful. <laughs> and, then, uh, so and they could even touch them, and some wanted to have them around their neck. And it was, it, it, it was really like an attraction on the first day. They, they then it was because of, oh, what's going on here? And then they came every day because what's going to happen today? And then there was always something new. It was had a big blinking thing, like open, like for Turkish store or snack bar. And so every day something else. It, it was also a museum of Orientalism because of this wish of traveling, this wish of being somewhere else, pr projecting yourself. Because when you're in such a room, what can you do? You only have your brain to help you out. And the problem is that you're in that room because your brain already left you out. So, But uh, I was thinking about this. So I, I've got very good paintings, 19th century uh, orientalistic paintings, and um, made cartels. And, and we had the guided tour from uh, professionals. When they became a garden center uh, for indoor plants, department indoor plants, and one day it was um, a concert hall where in nine square meters it's a bit, but also the room before. And the concert, it was a, a specific piece of Simeon Ten Holt, an amazing composer, um, Canto Ostinato, you might know, it's in a really it's a piece you get in total trance, which I really recommend to you, it's beautiful, Canto Ostinato, uh, obstinated song, something like this, it's really, um, it's, it's you get in a time warp and it's melodic but strange and wonderful. So this piece I chose particularly because it's a piece that really makes clear what I now got to call the elasticity of time. When you got the poem, you don't know if you're there 20 minutes or one and a half hour. And then, uh, so, so that's, that's probably also what happened to the person that gets in these awful uh, solitary confinement places. So that's why that this specific piece was, was played. And it has been very good because the, 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 let's say, patient or clients is always, how do you call them? The uh, residents is maybe the best word. Really had a, really participated very, very well. So I, I felt happy. And also some people of the personnel told me that they experience also themselves as kind of a healing process. It was good to experience this room in such many different ways and often in interactive ways. And I didn't, I wasn't off to that. It's just something like that happened as a, it was a nice present to hear that it was good for them. And then I thought, okay, well, uh, the day of the garden center, so this is in Dutch, but I, I, I decided to make a little, um, also book memory of it. It's, it's uh, more joy with indoor plants sorts, uh, growth, and care. And uh, um, I had, so, so the people who visited the garden center, they could pick up a plant they like and go with it. And before, if they would wish, we would portray them with their plant. And I just, it's an existing book in, in, uh, in German, which I, I kept the design and I put the portrait. And what's nice is that you have care, for instance, these orange things, and it's called Regular, regular. So, like, or uh, and then a, a special period of when the plant is at its best, and then it would be uh, the warrior round, or you know, it was it somehow sometimes it is working very well. And so you have residents, but you have also people working there, and you don't know who's who. And before you know, you ca uh, catch yourself thinking, well, that must be a resident, and then and then so often <laughs> you're. Because, of course, I know, but even though now I start forgetting it, but very often you're wrong. So that's really quite impossible. So, and that's, that's why I like this little booklet, because it catches you on your 
preconception. Cathedral. Um, let me see. So Cathedral, it's a book which is here. So you, uh, yeah, art history. Someone gave me this book on the left and said, well, that's really something for you. I didn't see why at the time, but I was grateful. And then I was working on the Cathedral of Monet, thinking he's the, he's a bit the precursor, or he's the pioneer of conceptual art in the sense of the serialty on, on one object. And meanwhile, I think, no, Lawrence Stern is, <laughs> is the father of contemporary art. I discovered thanks to Simon and Patrick. And then, um, so I was playing around with posters of the Cathedral de Rouen from Monet, and I thought, oh, that's the right moment to open the book that I got present. So I put it on my table in my studio, and then something very banal ha happened, but that struck me so much. You're gonna see, there is a, sh there you see a cross shadow? That was the, the spread image of the book. and. Very simply, of course, the, the, so the wooden window of my studio was just, yeah, balancing over the image. And the regularity of it, because now, of course, it's big jumps, but it goes one minute, one minute, one very, very slow, but you can't stop that process. Well, of course, if you move the book, but otherwise, comes a point where comes a pillar instead of a, a small wooden thing, and that pillar of that wall is going to eat the cathedral. So I decided that I'm going to let go my poster of money for a while because this was just, this struck me so, so much. It was, it was like classic music, to look at this image and see the shadow moving. I promise, no drugs there. It was just <laughs> a, real <laughs> a real honest, deep existential ex experience. And I thought, wow, this is just so simple, but I love it. And later, and also <coughs> with intelligent people telling me what they see, I realized, yeah, it's very special because, because it's, a cas it's a Gothic cathedral. It's a book from the 50s, the original book. So you have the, this bit of typography. Now you can see clearly it's not something contemporary. It's not fitting our design things. And, and there is a shadow that could be of any time happened to be a few years ago. But this, there's this layering of different time that, uh, that, that is special, I think, about the, the image. And what's also nice is that, so I, I, I made a book, as you see. It's too big to be a flip book, which I'm totally happy about, because I would be bothered. I think it would not fit. It would be just boring. It's the exactly original shape of the original book, the original size, so I, I just follow that. But the original book is very thin. And uh, yeah, so you have to be confronted to your patience slash impatience. I saw someone turning every page and I thought, how can you do that? It was the middle of a very busy art fair and I thought, that's very extraordinary. I can't do it myself. So it can be a bit of an object of meditation um, or it can be just uh, whatever, what it is. Yeah, so I just set a timer and I click on the, I took a photo each time it did beep beep and then I leave up to you to know how long it took. <laughs> so then once again, the story like what, uh, could these images exist out of the book or should they be just in the book? And I said, no, again, they can exist out of the book. I made them, I decided for a standard size, one meter wide, 65, uh, 60, whatever, <coughs> high. And then, but then they should be as unica, I thought, because it's a little monument of time. It's something very, yeah. Uh, yeah, there is this banality, but it's the unicity of every moment also. So it should not be in an edition. Each image exists once. And it was shown lately in, uh, in how do you, uh, Collectania, Photo Collectania in Barcelona, very wonderful, nice place. And uh, they, yeah, we show um, a selection of eight images out of the 126 in the book. And from that, that took me to the next thing because uh, the first slide about this project was the, the book was in a black case and it's a special edition of the book. 
And I wanted something, of course, to add to it, not only the case. And I thought, well, I'm looking for something that would do the opposite of what happened in the book. So not from light to darkness, but from darkness to light. And then I called my, uh, my printer and I said, what do you think? And said, well, there is this ink called, uh, what's the name already? Thermic ink, I think. And yeah, it's black. And when it gets heat, by heat, it becomes transparent. You have to think it's a bit like a lac. So I said, okay, let's try that out. And I, I chose another image from the original book, from the 50s, a standing, what you see, this uh, Gothic cathedral of Coutances, in that case, in Normandia. And I had it here screen with this specific ink. And when the sun passes on the image, then as the sun is passing, the, the image is revealing, as if in a lab somehow. I was so really happy with that, and I liked it so much, I decided, let's try to, to uh, to make this a bit bigger and to, to enhance the experience also in a size that you would fit in with your shoulder. So you really, when you stand in front of it, the magic of it grasps you uh, not only here, but also here. And uh, it took a while to manage to get it on that size because on the self-screening point of view, it's very complicated to do it without big waves or big defect that completely would obliterates the, the magic of the, of the thing. So it was a bit of a searching, but we managed. Um, I, did, I chose to make three, three cathedrals out of this book, um, one Roman, one Gothic, and one modern. This is a bit of a follower of Le Corbusier. This is in Nice, um, St. Jean d'Arc Church. And then I thought, then how wonderful is that you have three images together making 10 centuries and then when this, the if you have them next to each other um, because the image are 65 centimeter it's uh, it's about according to how high the sun is it will take 20 to 30 minutes approximately for the sun to travel across the image and reveal the image so then you can be just there and in one of one and a half hour you have 10 century opening up in front of you and that's very very beautiful experience. And now I have a very bad video, but I chose it on purpose instead of a very well Photoshop thing, because you can now you can see I'm not tricking you because you see <laughs> you see the decor, <coughs> and I hope it works because we didn't try it before. But so I hang it outside. Actually, it was at the psychiatry when I was working in a solitary confinement. You know, you do all these things at the same time, and this is an animation. You see now in a few seconds what happens in half an hour. And so it's very blurry, but uh, yeah, this is. And now to finish with the project I'm currently busy with, uh, photographic treatments, I how did this happen? It came from the cathedrals for me, you know, uh, but also again mixed with an assignment. Um, well, this is me with a person with Alzheimer in a very advanced stage, Olga. And I, I've been thinking, because uh, you know this cathedral, you have this core image and then how the shadow goes over and each time it's just a new image, but the core stays but sometimes there's these clouds and it's coming and then it's the image is more contrastful or, or flat because I didn't change the, the, the thing for the camera. So it's in the cathedral. And I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Dementia, I, I, I thank God I don't know personally in my family or friends someone with that awful disease. But I said, yeah, this is also so peculiar that a person always remain itself or himself or herself but even if you don't know even your own name, you still know if you like sugar in your coffee or not, or, you know, it's so strange. And, and it's so, so there is something like a hard, uh, uh, a hard disk in us, but it gets with this awful disease and these tangles in your electric transmission in your brain, it gets scratches and bumps and uh, dent end roads and things like this. So I, I felt so, bad about this disease that I, which I discovered being asked to do something about it by, 
actually by the same uh, museum. Then I decided to, to see what can I do that wouldn't be a comment upon what they experience, but that would be really a tool for a person with this disease to help them out a little bit. You, you can't cure from this disease. Um, only thing you can do is improve a little bit the, the well-being of the person as much as you can. And that's very, of course, very crucial to do because they suffer awful anxieties. So I decided, how can we use images to, uh, as a therapeutic tool? I started uh, reading a lot, talking to a lot of experts, and I decided I'm going to work with generic images. So that would be uh, a birdhouse, a sharpener, an African mask, an older lady with fizzy hair, uh, blah, 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 blah. Excellent. So like a uh, this, a uh, that, a uh, that. And I made a, f a photo database of about now about 2,000 images all black and white, all standing. I found most of them on internet, on the uh, Creative Commons, so free of, uh, of copyright. And some of them that I wanted that weren't there, I made myself. And then I thought, OK, so how to make this brain work? Because the main thing is the more you use your brain, even when you're very sick, uh, you should not make people too tired, of course, but it's good to use your brain. The more you use your brain, the slower you get Worse, simple, it's use it or lose it. So I started with all these images, what to do with these little blocks and things, and making nice associations and ask people to make association of these images. And then I decided I'm going to make, of course, my own for them and let them see if they like it or not. And that could be, again, probably in a, in a book form, should due to, to come at the end of the, before the summer. Um, it's going to be five daily photo doses, one, two, three, four, five, each book of 30 of these diptychs. I want them, I prefer five small books because, you know, all the people, they, 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 don't, they don't like heavy books, you know, that wouldn't do. And so it's better it's a bit light, they can take it on their bed, and, and I like if there are five in the institution, can be on different floors, it can get lost, and it's not a big deal. I chose also images that are easily, um, how do you say that, readable, legible for people with dementia. And it's really something very specific because if it's too close by, it's going to get abstract. They won't see it. They have really impaired vision. It can be worse or, or better, but it comes to a certain point where it's really difficult for them to see and at the very, uh, but this project is more aiming at people in a, in a bit earlier stage of the, of, of the disease when they are confused but they still can talk normally or more or less. They would forget every two minutes later what they just said before, but th you can still have uh, some bits of conversation. This is actually also aim aiming at not only this brain training thing, but also support conversation, because it's something very difficult that family is coming to visit, or friends, but you have nothing to tell each other, because, yeah, once you spoke about the weather, what now? Because there is not to talk about the past, because they forgot it. And the future is something difficult to really address. So. So I thought, yeah, that, that's good if people can look together at a book that will be hopefully nice also for the caretaker, that's also giving also a bit of fun and joy to the caretaker. And then the person with dementia will catch some association or not, and but uh, could, could enjoy that specific image or not, and but it could be a start for conversation. But I'm still in the middle of this. I'm trying now also different strategy to appear even deeper to the perception by silk screening. I just I did that already. The silk screening of these images also exist. I also printed a larger size, like also, I don't know, 80 centimeter wide, I think. And I silk screen them with smell, with daily kind of smell, like orange or uh, what there is, uh, well, things like that are pleasant, lavender, um, Lavender, uh, cumin, uh, what else? Soap, yeah, smells. So that because it's the principle of synesthesia, I don't know if you heard of it. 
synesthesia is that as, as uh, the more senses you use in, percep in the perception, the deeper will be the perception you have of that thing. So if you see and smell, or if you touch and see, for instance, the Montessori school, you know, they have all this system of also of uh, touching colored uh, numbers to teach children how to count. To so this is it's really a, a proven thing that the, the, um, the cognition will be more sustainable if you add more senses to the experience. So I, I'm, I've been experiencing with this smell to the image. Well, I'm not quite sure, actually. <laughs> this is I, I think, yeah, it, it's interesting, but I, I have to, to go further with this. I'm now in the process of um, uh, making the image uh, uh, relief, or to see a screen relief, for instance, will be some, some surfaces will be like sandpaper, and some surfaces will be um, like braille for blind people with a lot of little dots. So then you can also enjoy t the tactility of the image while you look at it. And in that sense, you're triggering things in different ways that, that is all useful and, and pleasurable. Uh, yeah, I think this is the, the last example of this diptychs that's going to come in the book. And this is also the last slide. I thank you for your, for your listening. Thank you very much. If we've got some questions, I think you know the uh, form. I run around with the microphone that doesn't project your voice. So <laughs> don't expect it to make any sound, but it will record you for the film. So if we've got some questions, that would be great <coughs> for Laurence. <coughs> Who is courageous here? Yeah, with the ones that you did of the is it the one eight uh, um, encyclopedia. Yes. Y the ones that you personally took the pictures. Did you like wait for the right moment, or did you just take loads, or just like one and go? I take loads. <laughs> uh, I take loads, and I and I choose later. It's more. I always do that. I take many, many, and then <laughs> then I choose something. Yeah, I mean, some people send me just one image. And some people send me 10 images, but when it's me taking the image, at least I have a bit of a choice. Also, because as you saw in the image, you are in the page, you have other material, and then it's good to kind of, a, you can choose a little bit according to that too sometimes. It's nice to be able to make little extra uh, wings or something like this, so, yeah. You think it's a good idea, or you think I should have taken only one? <laughs> Hi, how you doing? Hi. Hi. Um, has Vivian May, uh, Vivian Mayer, ever played uh, a part in your inspiration? Sorry. Uh, uh, Vivian Mayer. She was a French photographer. Has, has uh, she ever um, given you any influence at all as a mm. photographer? Vivian May. Yeah, yeah, Mayer. Oh, Vivian Mayer. Yeah, yeah. Ah, yeah, I, yeah. No, I, I know only one image from her. She's uh, someone walking in the street, and there is a cast shadow of someone else on the back of someone. Is that right? Oh, yeah. Is what you refer to? Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if, if she's um, given you any influence in your but life. Actually, I know only that image of her. Yeah. I'm ashamed, but that's it. And uh, so she didn't really know. And I discovered it later. But you know, so many other people did what I've been doing. I, dis I discovered in the process. And sometimes even while I was already, if I remember well, while I was busy with uh, asking for authorization to work in the Louvre, a friend said, showed me images from Okay, Luigi Ghiri did very nice images of people in museums and in front of paintings. Who else? Martin Parr did in uh, art fairs. And then, you know, but yeah, I think somehow it was, what they did was quite in incidental. And I thought, well, I'm doing it uh, a bit in a constant way. Or let's say, in a, in a uh, my research is, is, is worse in the sense of it's wider also. And uh, hopefully I can have an own voice in that thing. Uh, but it's of course very useful if friends tell you, look at this, look at that, and this happened, that, happa that happened. I think it's a beautiful image from Vivian May, by the way. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for asking. Take care. Thank 
you so much. Um, could you talk to me a little bit how you convince people um, to, to partake or collaborate with you? You discussed, you know, once you've um, you decided that you were going to, you know, work with people, how, how do you go about convincing them? Is, is it an easy process or does it take months? If it would take months, I would, uh, I think I would give up, probably. <laughs> uh, it's not easy neither, but there is one thing clear. In every community, or if you deal with a community, there are always some people that are already are a bit of this, um, how would you say, informal leaders that have a voice, or, or at least a lot of people know them, and they're you know, they kind of playing some role, uh, core role. And the main thing you have to concentrate is convince them and then after you have this sheep thing, no? everybody's following. And for Tristotropic at the end, we had too many people and it, we had to, to disappoint people. That was really strange. But to give you a bit more of um, how we, we did for this Tristotropic, it was a residency, as I told you, and there is often friends of the residency. So we invited them for a nice dinner and said, we really need you on that. Uh, okay, okay. And so which image could you do? Okay, well, okay, I would do that one, that one, that one. Good. These people have a family, obviously, and they very often live very close by. So we invited um, Ronald and I, then we, we did a couple of presentations, I think three Sundays in a row, we, uh, with coffee and cakes, good cakes, good coffee, <laughs> and then very short presentation, 15 minutes max, some slides about my work, his work, about mostly Levi Strauss, Tristropic, and then explaining why we really think it would be beautiful to do it there with them and how what a wonderful work is going to be. And then we even had, um, I think it was a clever, s a clever idea, to we had uh, the photocopies of the Tristropic book um, as black and black and white photocopies on the on the wall. And the people who already said they're going to participate, we put them on post-it on it. So it was Helga, Gertrude, Pete, and so forth. And so. Yeah, that worked like this. So after the after little presentation, you drink and say, ah, so what are you? So which one do you choose? Where would you? And this way, you know, this way. And then going a lot to the bar, the, the local one bar, drinking enough for have time to really know with people in a different way. A lot, uh, a lot of French fries at the snack bar, taking time to talk and lose time with people and enjoy, yeah, to meet them. and bring it so far that they feel that you're genuine and that they also want to share an experience with you. And that's how it went, I think. And also we put an ad in a local journal, a local newspaper. And then we got these beautiful young girls, like 18 years old, total beauty, Brigitte Bardot of, Fris of Frisia, uh, from the neighborhood. That they, they say, yeah, we want to participate to your project, want that image, that image, and they were all naked images. And they said, Are you sure? I don't want your family to be crossed and you to regret in some years and really think about it. No, 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 we want it because we love art and actually we're thinking to become, to, to, to become art students ourselves and yeah, it would be a really beautiful experience and all that. Yeah, if you're sure that your family uh, is feeling okay with it and you're sure yourself, then okay, we do that. But yeah, that was through the local newspaper. Then you think, what is this? It's very strange. Yeah, you couldn't dream of that they would want to participate. But when you really do your best with something, then there is always little miracles that happen. You feel some angels are there to help you just a little bit, yeah. And people in the Netherlands are very open-minded, I must say. People are really, they, they think, yeah, it's fun, why not? And uh, they ask themselves the question, why not more than why should I? When in France, I think it would have been certainly more difficult, much more, it may be impossible, I don't know, yeah. And maybe completely impossible in the UK. <laughs> <laughs> um, any more questions, please? I can't remember the name of it, but the one where you changed the function of the room in the psychiatric ward. Yeah. I was just wondering if you did you stick around to notice if the effect, like the effects it had on the patients afterwards when the room became just a normal isolation room again. Ah, yeah. A good question. Did you see it in a different light or? 
think it's just back to normal. Honestly, no. I think I, I, it was so. It was it was every week, every day uh, for a whole week, and after the week, I was so dead myself. <laughs> and I, and but I had I had seen I had experience that it was good vibes. That it was quite what it happened beyond my expectation in participation and compliments or things like this. And you know, people with psychiatric background or how do you say, constitution, they don't lie. They don't care for making you feel comfortable. Or so it's just, it just what it is you get, like a pull in your face. So I had the feeling that moment had been true, the good things, the bad things, but it, it had been true and I, I got, for me, oh yeah, I didn't tell you, there was this strange sketch with all the flat screens, right? The sketch, and it was just, it was just a sketch because I don't have any better documentation because then it stayed at the museum after the, the lesson. But it's, uh, s that's how I decided to, to document the work. I made small loops of different lengths of every day, always um, from the same perspective in the, in, in the room, in the cell. So then, so you see every day, uh, some loop, one loop will be 10 minutes and one loop will be one and a half minutes. And they all, and then you see, it starts with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, uh, so you see the days of the week and then you see, and it starts moving. And the music you hear is the one from this canto ostinato that you hear this trance music about this kind of time. But uh, no, I, d I didn't stay to get more documentary information because I thought I got enough material for myself. Why do you ask? <coughs> Sorry? I was just wondering to see if it did have a positive or negative effect afterwards, even though obviously it was just a good thing and it mm. should be seen as. Yeah, no, that would be good to know, of course, to, to see really what is the impact. You, you hit a point because if you could prove there is an impact, but then for that you need to be another kind of professional then you could say, come on, you know, we can do things with these rooms that, that can, you know, it could be you also use a bit as a tool for transition to a new, to whatever new form they're going to find to, to solve difficult problems that they are trying to find in this way, to, to solve in this way. But you're right, no, but I didn't get involved with people that could, but I heard from some people of the personnel that they say, well, it's really, uh, it's has been more helpful than, they just, at the start, they said, OK, we're going to cooperate because they were proud that they were not using this, this room anymore so much. So they were proud. And they want to say, look, we are functioning so well. We don't do that to people here anymore. But yet, of the two rooms, one had to always be empty in case of something would happen. I mean, to tell you. Huh, it's, uh, um, but they had told me that it had been unexpectedly positive for, for them and for that some patients also reacted very well. And I got presents, you know, peop people come to you with a drawing, with uh, uh, the, the patients, I mean, that they make you clear that when they're happy about something also. Um, I, I know you met one of our senior academics on Tuesday um, who conducted an interview with you, um, uh, Harold Offe, and he's very interested in a project he's doing called Covers. And I, I'm, I just wanted to ask you um, about this idea of facsimiles yeah. and the idea of the copy. Um, it seems quite prevalent at the moment um, in, in, in contemporary art. It, could you talk a little bit about why it matters to you to, to kind of Work so closely with these ideas of the of the, of the facsimile, please. Uh, sure. Um, I like the humor of it because it becomes a little an undercover book or a little guerrilla book, or it's infiltrating in strange places where, by mistake, where it was not meant to be. For instance, I gave I was too insecure to tell the Louvre. Uh, right away like would you like to sell my book in your library uh, because i'm going to get maybe a court case or whatever so infamous complications forget it but i gave a bunch of book to the bookinists you know the along the sand the people with the green box selling secondhand books i just gave them and i thought it's going to be fun because you know some people might buy it just thinking they buy a catalog of the louvre and then they're back in korea and they open and say oh no this is awful heads everywhere and uh, 
And then, you know, just, I like the joke of it. I like the, and I like the lightness of it. Yeah, and then the, the first one I did, it was in 2005 with the encyclopedia. It was, it was, it was my most hardcore facsimile, 700 pages. Yeah, I don't know, it's, um, yeah, it's why, yeah, I think that's it. There is something about also the, the irritation of the original source, in that case, that encyclopedia, so that was good to make his twin brother, that would be very different, so, or somehow radically a little bit, a little bit radically different, but, uh, but it's not always like this, because this has nothing with, this has more to do about uh, a wonderful experience, a, a deep experience I had, and I thought I want to give exactly that back to people. So, so, so it's always shifting, and some books I did have nothing to do with facsimile, but that's true that all, all this, this one, for instance, isn't, and some more books I did aren't. But uh, that's true that it's something fun. But now I get to the point, I get myself a bit bored of it. I think I, d I don't expect, I would, you know, of course, each time you ask yourself, so should I, should I not, or what and how, what's the right size, uh, the right shape, the right form. But uh, yeah, it should not, yeah, it's not a necessity to, once you do it in a few times, then maybe it's, it's okay. Thank you. Is there any more questions, please? Well, just uh, end by saying thank you very much, Lawrence Agatow. Thank, thank you. you, Simon.